Hello everyone, Oral here. Many probably know that procedural generation in games is, in short, when the game itself creates content for the player. For instance, when the game designer doesn't need to create all of the smallest details in the map. It is instead generated by different algorithms each time, which gives a huge boost to the replayability of the game. But at the same time, it often sacrifices detail and how elaborate the locations can be. I checked out some procedurally generated games. I then returned to the Hammer Editor for CSGO, but I kept asking myself the question, is it possible to create a procedurally generated map in CS? Even if not in its entirety, then as much of it as possible, with a majority being randomized, since then the replayability of the map would be high. Soon after that, Operation Shattered Web came out. Contained within were unused scripts, dedicated to a certain dungeon mode, which apparently worked on the principle of generating floors. In total, this mode was supposed to have 17 floors, the first of which was the starting one, and then the remaining 16 were floors with enemies of varying difficulty. I started looking on the internet for such things, but the closest thing I could find were levels that randomly toggled elements on and off. That's a good starting point. But that wasn't enough for me. I wanted more. Of course, CSGO with its version of the engine does not allow for such complicated things, but our fingers are made for work. So I began to study scripts which could be integrated into maps in the Squirrel language, since I was only familiar with Hammer at the time. I had already tried to do some randomly generated things back in CSS, which, by the way, had a map called CS Havana, where doors were randomly opened and closed, blocking and opening different paths. I also tried random doors leading to different corridors. I tried random weather, random effects, random weapons and stuff like that. I put all this together in a small test room in the form of a warehouse, and the first thing I tried to generate were the boxes. I wanted the various boxes to act as cover, but also for them to look different every time. I selected some boxes to be placed on the ground, and several other ones for higher up, to spawn on top of the other ones. And this worked! Hooray! After this I started adding more and more box variations. I added the ability to paint some of them in different colours. As a result, the warehouse turned into a room full of boxes, which could be traversed in different ways. I also generated different variations of doors with different colours. Drunk on success, my imagination ran wild at the thought of what I could do next. I thought it was worth making a co-op mission out of this, because that would be cool, and I liked my existing map very much. But randomly generated boxes won't go far on their own, so I started thinking about how to generate rooms, and so started my battle against the limitations of the Source engine. The problem is that not every brush can simply be spawned or moved without causing problems, and even if it does work, there might still be drawbacks to doing it. Many prop types disable collision for ragdolls, which means that after dying, players' bodies will fall through the level, and in some cases, taking weapons with them. The best solution I found was to use Funk Move Linear, as it preserves collisions between objects very well. However, if I wanted to assemble a room from random pieces, then a new problem now stood in my way. All decals are duplicated for all brushes, so if you shoot at one, then the same decals will appear on all of the other identical brushes. But my biggest problem was with the lighting. Strange gaps were often visible around the edges of the props. It turns out that you shouldn't put the no-draw texture on the edges that you can't see, like you would normally for optimization purposes. You instead need to cover everything with proper textures. And to not make brushes too thin, because otherwise, from a distance, light can still shine through. But even dealing with this, it still doesn't solve the problem with baked-in lighting. All lighting in CSGO is baked onto the props before the map is loaded, and this can look wrong when these props are then moved about randomly in the level. There is dynamic lighting in the game, but you can't expect miracles from it. It can only calculate lighting in real time, without casting any shadows, and the results can often look janky and can shine through solid objects. There is also a projected texture tool. This creates dynamic shadows, which can be very useful, but not so much when you can only have one of these per map. If you manage to get several of these working at the same time, then it can lead to terrible graphical problems. It also doesn't work very well in conjunction with direct lighting from the sun. For example, if you made a wall to spawn in different places, then it still somehow manages to give each surface some lighting information, which can look wrong depending on where it ends up being placed. If it is in the shade, then the wall will look black, and all lighting on this surface is ignored. And if it's in the sunlight, only the faces that are in the sunlight will be lit normally, and will receive the correct shadows.
По итогу я решил немного плюнуть на это дело. I still try to create random rooms from different wall templates, and it turned out not so good. Так себе. But then I remembered that props have correct lighting regardless of where they're being spawned. Вне зависимости от их расположения после спауна. So I tried another trick. I made templates for different rooms of different sizes. Some had exits and entrances, others were simple dead-end rooms. A couple of the rooms had a double exit for a fork and a long corridor that could connect two starting doors. And then I made all of these templates into models. This fixed the lighting problems and also let me change the colors of the walls to add variety to these rooms. But using props means that ragdolls will fall straight through them. So I made an invisible funk move linear for each room type to deal with the collisions. The direct lighting from the sun works really well on these rooms, now they're made of models. But unfortunately, since they're rooms, they're inside, away from sunlight. So there are two ways I can light them up. The first is to give each room model a fake, uniform lighting, but this looks really bad. Alternatively, I could put dynamic lighting everywhere, which does not have shadows, shines through everything and everyone else, and eats frame rates. Especially if one light source overlaps another. Unfortunately, this was one problem I couldn't overcome, and I accepted that there would be limitations to how good these rooms would look with either method. Either that, or I made all rooms roofless so that they could be lit by direct sunlight. I put lighting on hold and moved on to the challenge of trying to generate rooms so that they connected with each other convincingly. And it worked. I successfully devised a way of generating random building layouts so that every time you played it, the result would be different. So I at least had some success. I did a couple of tests to see what different room interiors might look like. I got them to decorate themselves with random details. You know, stuff like random rubbish on the tables and clutter on the shelves. I liked all of this. But this causes a problem for bot AI. How will they walk if the nav grid that they follow is generated before the layout is? Surely they would just run into boxes, crash into walls, and lose the player instantly. And then I remembered that there was a special brush that was used on the D Vertigo map, which allows you to block parts of the nav grid so that bots go to certain points. I decided to experiment with this. I split the entire navigation grid into a connected grid composed of small individual sections. And in places where boxes and rooms appeared, brushes were added, signaling to bots that there was no need to walk there. And to my amazement, this worked. Bots went around boxes and even entered rooms to find the player, even in the most distant parts of the map. But it wasn't without problems. When it came to adding nav blockers to the rooms that were generated, while it spawned okay, it wouldn't work if it was rotated by even the tiniest amount. I could do nothing but write a message to the developers to ask them for help. After a bit of communication, the problem was discovered to be the entity, which marks the rooms and then spawns them in the right place. The only solution to the problem at that time was to move the whole thing to the zero coordinate. Doing this meant it worked, but my project became impossible when dealing with this limitation. Fortunately, after a while the developers released an update in which they fixed this bug and I was relieved to be able to return everything back to its correct place again. So while it sounds like my problems were behind me, there was one final problem with my randomly generated warehouse map. It would be necessary to make some kind of plot if this was to be a co-op level. Maybe the players arrive at the warehouse and then find a secret elevator to the subway where the floors are generated. Or maybe they're escaping from prison and have to return to the surface by fighting through all of the different floors. All of these were stupid ideas, since they all forced me to create a level comprising of lots of enclosed rooms underground. Hello, dungeon. I made a simple elevator to unnoticeably teleport the player to the starting point of each floor they then had to fight through. But at this point, I got a little tired and didn't know what I wanted to do next with this project. Plus various problems and other hobbies were overwhelming me, and in the end, I wanted to take a break. During this time away from it, I hoped to come up with ideas on how to develop the generation of floors. I implemented some small things, but it didn't really feel right. Amidst the development of this disaster, Gabe Follower gave me an idea to make an aim map. I myself had a similar idea, to do something small and to let others build on it. But I didn't really want to trade all this work for so little. I thought it would be easy, like something that would take just a few days, maybe a week. After more than six months of stagnation on the co-op map project, I decided to revisit the project and to try something different. I started from scratch with the intention of developing an aim map. 
I developed better scripts, though I must admit it took longer to get it right with this aim map than it did to generate the co-op level. First of all, I made a square test arena, in which all of the same boxes on one side spawned randomly. But what about the spawns of the players themselves? Up till now, they had always appeared in the same specific spawn areas. This problem was solved by spawning players in a separate room, then to teleport them over to the main map once it's finished generating. Then I began to think about the setting, and again, for some reason, I liked the idea of warehouses, sort of like Nuke. Later, I began to wonder if it would be cool to randomly generate different map themes. For example, Nuke one round, Dust another, then Inferno, then Vertigo, and so on. Symmetrical maps could be based on Dust's theme, and then Nukes could be used for more chaotic layouts. Because it's Nuke. For it, I had it so that teams started in warehouses, then I had some boxes, but halfway through development, I decided I wanted to split the map down the middle, so that one team would spawn inside a warehouse and the other out on the street. And in the middle somewhere would be the entrance to the warehouse itself, which would shift every time, making the warehouse longer or shorter. This warehouse entrance was made up of different pieces, different numbers of approaches, of variable widths and lengths. I made different walkways above the main level, which would only sometimes be generated. Sometimes they'd appear, but they would be unreachable. But that's part of random level generation. After all, I didn't want these walkways to be frequently used. Having tweaked the arena's generation, I then made a few different backdrops so that the map did not look like it was in the middle of a wasteland every time. And then I varied how much clutter there could be. Perfect. I was finally happy with everything. The spawns were varied, the backdrops gave it atmosphere, the sky was random, and the gameplay was always different. I then developed a starting room with settings where you could choose which weapons you wanted to play with, and later added more stuff to it like health settings, amount of ammunition, layout type, and the choice of map seed, which will be discussed a little later. I was very happy with everything at this point. I then added an inferno theme. I wanted to shove everything into this project. So many ideas, different map themes, assets which could be generated symmetrically or asymmetrically, layouts which could be generated in the style of many existing CSGO maps. I crammed all of this into one map. It was going to be perfect. And then... <sighs> I forgot what I was dealing with. Hello, Source, and your 2048 entity limit. There was too much of everything in the map. One minute I was casually decorating the map with Inferno assets, and the next, everything was ruined. And I hit this limitation while most of the project was still using placeholder nuke assets. Regardless, I still wanted to finish this project. In addition to these problems, there was another restriction on top of all of this that is displayed by using the dump game string table console command. Every entity, every object name change, every sneeze is entered into this table and it is not cleared. It creeps towards the 65,000 figure in this entertaining text adventure, then when you finally reach it, the Source Engine will congratulate you with this. I worked with Ansimist to figure out what to do about this. We tested different things out and came up with different theories about why this was happening. We tested different approaches to spawning items and renaming them. We tried to spawn items in different ways through different functions and some options even worked, at least partially. But then I'd go and rewrite all the code and all it would do would be to delay the crash by a few rounds or so. <sighs> but who knew that this could all be fixed by changing this one thing? After wasting so much time dealing with this problem, it was decided to postpone the Nuke theme, to cut out everything connected with Nuke's layouts to save for a separate map in the future sometime, and to make this map focus on just one style, and that was to be Inferno's. This was chosen since by this time I had already fully fleshed out the Inferno theme, right down to the trims and facades. Doors, windows, entrances, all sorts of stuff. I didn't expect it to work as well as it did. It turned out better than everything I had done previously. Empty walls immediately turned into fully fledged houses, whereas previously with Nuke's theme, I didn't even know what to fill the warehouse with. This is probably why I decided to postpone Nuke and to prioritize Inferno. At least if people like this, you can always make a separate map with the same system, but with a different style. I greatly reduced the number of entities. Combining a huge number of curbs into just one model using the auto combine tool helped me a lot. This is a tool from Valve that combines multiple models into just one. However, as with many of Valve's tools, you cannot understand it without a crystal ball. Special thanks to Sergio Morozov for the detailed article that describes how to use this miraculous bit of technology. Now, instead of almost a thousand border models, I have no more than 20. It seemed like I had finally figured out how to remain below the limit. Then I decided that in some places I would have textures from different sites. 
Sometimes you'll see a fountain appear from bombsite A. There was a lot of trouble with this. All the water spilled in a dynamic way, plus it didn't have reflections, only a dark, muddy texture. After wasting six hours looking for solutions, I found one very interesting thing. The game has a brush with which you can make reflections in real time if using a special texture. After some experimentation, I combined the water with a new reflective surface, in which I added fake animations of waves and got real dynamic water working. In theory, it was perfect, like a Swiss watch. But in practice, it caused countless problems, especially when the player was far from the water, so I unfortunately had to disable this beautiful water trick that I had discovered. I began to move the ideas I had for Nuke over to Inferno's theme, to have a room on one side and an open area on the other. Only now, there's the possibility of several different indoor and outdoor spaces being generated, while the mid is now often generated independently from the sides, and can also be selected from a number of possible presets. I also improved the object spawning system. Before, I placed points where things could spawn, but now a separate brush sets the area in which these square shelters can appear. I did the same for the generation of building decorations and so on and I could set a maximum number of objects in each area so that the map was never overwhelmed with too much clutter. In addition to all of this, I was repeatedly suggested to add a seed generation system to the map. This is a system to generate the same layout every time, because it is cool to be able to replay map layouts that you've enjoyed, or have found to be particularly unique. Plus, it helps a lot in debugging such a project. Thanks to a 40-year-old pal named Ansimist for helping me understand some of the code that made this system possible. Imagine my surprise that this system can be written in just a few short lines of code, although I was afraid that I would never come close to understanding it. I had to choose between two different methods of generating a random seed. The first was to use pi, although any long number would also work. Long story short, I do this if I want to generate a random number. In this example, I'll generate a random number between 0 and 11, the result being 8, which is the remainder once 58,979 is divided by 11. The alternative method was to pass a ray through a generated displacement, and to use the resulting distance from that ray to the relief as the number from which, by dividing, we get the remainder, which would be our random result. I decided to stick with the pi number, and unfortunately found that the squirrel language has some kind of limitation on integer sizes. Fortunately, they are still large enough, provided I limit the choice of seeds from zero to just 10 million, which should be enough for most players. Plus, for each seed, there is a variant of the layout type, of which there are three in total, so this results in 30 million different variations to the Inferno aim map. Let's go back to the three different layout types I briefly covered earlier. There is asymmetric, which is random for both sides. Then there's semi-symmetrical and symmetrical. Initially, I wanted to make everything chaotic, like on Nuke. I find this the most interesting, but then I've got to remember that not everyone will like this. After all, aim maps are usually symmetrical, so that each team has equal chances. Chaotic layouts are typically reserved for other game modes. But still, I left this in, and I really like it. You won't find a drop of symmetry about it, while in the symmetrical version, each box will be mirrored diagonally, situated in the same place for both sides. The only thing that ignores symmetry are superficial details, like the surrounding houses and the facades. They continue to generate according to the chaotic rules. And so are the colours of things, but this shouldn't greatly affect gameplay. The semi-symmetrical version is completely symmetrical in terms of map geometry. For example, if a building appears on one side, then it will be the same on the other, but the cover around it will be generated randomly. The map generation has suffered some problems, and I've caught a number of bugs, but the result of all this hard work is a randomly generated map in an Inferno style. So yes, procedurally generated maps in CSGO are possible, but are difficult to do. Feel free to play this map right now. Its workshop page will be in the description and at the end of this video. I await your feedback and any constructive criticism you have about this map's idea and execution. Leave comments down below. Should I try to make a co-op map next? After all, having finished this project, I have much more knowledge than I did when I started out. I believe I can push this project further and already have some ideas I'd like to try out in a co-op game type but I don't know if it's worth taking the time or if enough people even want this kind of experience. So I'm waiting for your comments on this topic. Try the map, subscribe to my real channel and not this three clicks Philip imposter, and join the VK group for it. Thank you all and bye until our next meeting.